Greetings, my name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the, the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Welcome to our channel where we cover everything D&D, including advice for players and guides for DMs. We upload new videos on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Today, we're going to make some magic and share with you our tips for homebrewing spells for your games of D&D 5e. We love homebrewing spells because they come in a very simple package, making them one of the easiest first steps into homebrewing before you step into the wider world of creating your own classes, subclasses, or even worlds. Spells are often one of the first gateways into the world of homebrewing. Spells also are one of the things that will teach you about how the power level progresses across Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition, both on the side of players and monsters, because there's something that not only can your players learn the new spells that you homebrew, but your villains can also show up with them as well. And while the balance considerations are a little bit different on both sides of the equation, because of this universality of spells, they can really add a lot to your games. Um, and one of the things that I love the most about homebrewing spells is showing off that new spell with a villain and then allowing the players to find their spell book and learn that spell for themselves. It's a really fun way to bring your own creative energy into your games. So let's make some magic and talk about our tips for homebrewing spells. There's a lot to discuss today, so let's get rolling. One of the most important questions and the greatest place to start is to decide what the fantasy of your spell is. There's a lot of reasons why we want to start here, but first and foremost, you just got to have an idea of what the cool thing you want to happen on the table is. What is the mental image that you have when you see a wizard, sorcerer, or whoever casting the spell at the table? Rather than thinking about how much damage your spell does yet, rather than thinking about what its saving throws are or anything else like that, the first step to homebrewing a great spell is writing down the pitch of what people see and experience. Write this in flavorful and descriptive language. If you have a spell in your mind that causes the target to teleport into someone's body and explode out their back, write that down. We're not even getting into any game balance ideas. We're not even getting into any mechanics yet. We just want to think of the mental image of what is happening. This is because when you're sharing your spell for feedback from others, whether it's from your players or other people in the community, having this log line of what the magic actually is, is really helpful in determining what's actually in your head with the spell. Not only does this give you the flavor text that you can then use when you're creating the text box for your spell, maybe summarizing it into one or two sentences, but I do find that most spells advertise themselves better with a line or two of flavor text. But also, when we talk in so several of our videos about reflavoring, Maybe you have this idea for a spell called the Puppet Master, where you can link minds with a creature and use your mind to mimic it like a puppet. Well, you could just use Dominate Person as the same effect. And you go, oh, that spell does exist. I could just word it differently or imagine the way my caster uses it differently. In this case, coming up with the flavor text and sharing that with a few close friends can really help you decide if there's already a spell that kind of does this or if you are working on the path of something unique and interesting. If you have any inspiration from, say, the power of one of your favorite superheroes or something that you've watched in one of your favorite television shows or movies or video games, include that in the description as well, particularly when you are sharing it for feedback too. It really helps to get everybody on board with what the big idea behind the spell is because I do think so often when we are giving feedback on these homebrew creations, we immediately get down to, okay, so how much damage are you doing? What is your saving throw? What is the mechanics of this? And lose sight of what is the thing that makes the spell cool. Never lose sight of that throughout the entire process. While you're imagining this, the other important aspect is to decide which classes are going to be able to cast the spell. Depending on the flavor of the spell that you're making, you might want to consider how that fits into the world of Dungeons and Dragons. If you're creating a spell that involves plants and vines in some way, well, it's probably going to be a druid spell. So if you put it on the wizard and sorcerer spell list and not the druid spell list, people are going to wonder why the druid couldn't take it. Meanwhile, if you're going a bit more the arcane route or the divine route, keep in mind the differences between what a sorcerer's spellcasting feels like and what a cleric spellcasting feels like. 
Across the different classes, there are many types of effects and features that different classes tend to specialize in more than others. You might notice, for example, that sorcerers, warlocks, and wizards very rarely get healing spells, and when they do, they usually tend to come with some sort of counterbalance, whereas clerics and druids and bards tend to get the full smorgasbord of all the healing spells that are in the game. On the flip side, the big, flashy, area of effect damage spells tend to be found on the sorcerers and wizards, and ironically enough, despite this, clerics tend to get a lot of those too. <laughs> yeah. But they tend to have a bit more of a divine, radiant damage flavor flavor to them. Most of the spells on the druid spell list usually require concentration of some kind. There's very few non-concentration spells on that druid list. Druids very rarely get teleportation effects unless they're involving plants or animals in some way. So it is very interesting to think about what kind of effects the different classes get. Because, well, it's not necessarily um, impossible for a class to have access to a spell that is very different from what it normally does. Of course, almost everybody gets Polymorph, for example. It is something to think about in how much you care about having each class be unique. If it really matters to you that clerics and druids and bards are the only ones that get healing spells then that's fine. One of my teachers once told me that the reason why we teach you the rules is so that you can break them properly. So one thing to keep in mind as we go through this is we are teaching you our guidelines and rules. But if you decide that a druid, especially say a wildfire druid, should get a fireball-like spell and you decide to create a nature wildfire spell that's similar to fireball but a little bit more natural in its elements, then by all means go for it. If you decide to break the mold, that is often why a lot of us set out to homebrew. But it is important to understand why the molds are there and why these structures exist. Diverging too far from them can actually upset the balance of the game. But this is your playground to play around in, so have fun. And the good thing about spells in general is because they are so compartmentalized, if you do upset the balance with a single spell, it's easy to adjust that without making it feel like you've broken someone's entire character. That's why homebrewing spells is so great, because they're really easy to inject in your game. And then if you do run into problems, it's really easy to address it and adjust it. One other element of creating the flavor of your spell, which can have some mechanical implications, but not as many as you think, is actually the school of magic. Most classes get access to spells across all of the schools of magic entirely, uh, aside from, of course, arcane tricksters and eldritch knights. But the school of magic is really much more of a classification without any sort of mechanical relevance, except in the case of wizards, eldritch knights, and now some of the sorcerer subclasses. But it's surprisingly less relevant to the overall balance of your spell, whether it's conjuration or evocation. I will say, though, that if you are designing a spell and think to yourself, wow, the spell would be really cool on an Eldritch Knight and would really benefit them, then you do want to be aware of the School of Magic and the fact that you need to make it available to wizards. So those are the times that you need to be aware of it. But generally speaking, a lot of classes and a lot of the spellcasters don't really care what School of Magic it is. Nevertheless, Schools of Magic are a wonderful flavor element, and if you are having trouble figuring out which School of Magic to fit your spell into, there's a great description that breaks down all the different Schools of Magic in the Player's Handbook, and one of the best ways to figure it out is really to just read the spells. I think that the, the third level spells generally advertise the big idea behind that School of Magic the best, I find. So now let's talk about balancing, and there's going to be several components to actually balancing our spells. First and foremost, one of the most important mechanics of 5th edition is concentration. So how do you determine if your spell should have concentration or not? I actually have a very simple suggestion here. If your spell has a duration, so it's not an instantaneous effect, but if it lasts about a minute or an hour and you're imagining it being a combat spell, by default, put concentration on it and play test it to see if it doesn't need it. Assume that your spell should probably require concentration and unless proven otherwise. An important idea with concentration is that when you don't give a spell concentration, you want to keep in mind how it layers with other concentration based spells. If you give a spell no concentration, think about how it works with flying or invisibility or if they use a wall of fire or wall of force spell. Uh, these spells 
are important to not be able to layer on top of each other. A lot of concentration spells are the more powerful spells in the game. And if we could use multiple of them at the same time, they can create really dangerous effects. So that's the one thing that you want to keep in mind. How does this create combinations with other spells? You might have an idea for a really great buff spell, but what happens if that buff spell gets combined with a summoning spell? <laughs> Again, it's really worth measuring out how these effects could possibly stack. And this is where knowing the other spells that the class that you're designing for has access to will give you a barometer to assume. And assume the worst case scenario. <laughs> and if it looks broken, it probably is. That's why when in doubt, stick with concentration. Test it that way. And if it feels like the spell's too weak otherwise, try it out. We did have a case where we were homering a spell that was very powerful, contaminated power where we put concentration on it and we decided, you know what? Let's rip that band-aid off and see just how powerful the spell can get. And it turned out to be pretty okay. It is meant to be an OP spell though. That was our design intent. So be careful there. Along with concentration, you also want to consider the casting time of your spell. Perhaps it's going to be an, a spell that requires an action or a bonus action or a minute, hour or longer in order to cast. Really, when you're trying to decide between the action and bonus action, this is where your flavor and idea of the spell might help advertise this. Again, with the spell, is it something that a spellcaster can pull off very quickly? And again, comparing it to the other options. If they combine this with one of their cantrips that they can use as an action, is there a one-two punch that you either think is too powerful or that you love? Being able to pair a bonus action spell with something like the new Tasha's uh, cantrip Mind Sliver can create some really cool ideas. And maybe you want that, or maybe that's too dangerous for you. In general, if you're going to be make a spell that is going to be used in combat, start with having it be an action and assess later if it needs to become a bonus action. Many bonus action spells are ones that are thought about of what will happen if the spell is combined with the character making an attack or using a cantrip. So there are usually augmentations in that sort of way, like the Paladin Smite spells, or Hunter's Mark, or Hex, or Misty Step. There, you don't really see a spell very often that is Fireball, but cast as a bonus action. <laughs> On the flip side, if your spell is gonna be cast as a minute, it's probably now going to be a non-combat spell, and we'll talk about more about that later. Just in general, when you are designing your spells, try comparing it to other spells of the same level. See how these spells in the same level or category, are there a lot of bonus action spells? What do those look like in comparison to the action spells? What's the general damage and output that they're doing, and how are they used? There are a few exceptions though. Never compare your spell to spiritual weapon. Spiritual <laughs> weapon is the exception that breaks all the rules. It's a bonus action, non-concentration spell that weaponizes your bonus action on subsequent turns. That's the exception. Don't, don't create another spiritual yeah. weapon. We love spiritual weapon. It's one of our favorite spells. But if you're trying to decide if your spell is balanced, comparing it to spiritual weapon, if it's more powerful, you're unbalanced. Yeah, and comparing your spell to other spells of the same level is pretty much the fundamental way where we're going to decide what level should your spell be. <laughs> um, interestingly enough, um, spells, depending on their level, can almost have any sort of effect. There are spells that deal damage of all levels. There are spells that incapacitate foes that start at first level, like Sleep and effectively Tash's Hideous Laughter, Hold person comes online at second level. So you can almost have any effect at any level of play. It's just that the more powerful effects tend to, the higher level your spell is, generally the more reliable it is, the more damage it deals, or sometimes you get spells that combine an, a, a status effect with damage. Those tend to be the very high level things. One of the other things that tends to happen with high level spells is you can have a lower level spell effect cast at a higher level and no longer require concentration. Great example of this, Wall of Force and Force Gauge. So it's also important to consider how much damage your spell is going to do. If it is a damage dealing spell, there's a few things to keep in mind. Again, comparing it to other spells of the same level is important, but also keep in mind the damage type it does. Does it have any other effects? These are all going to impact how much damage it should do. As a rough rule of thumb, a spell which can reliably hit two targets when it's cast will do about 2d6 damage per spell level. 
However, if that spell does fire damage, it usually does an about 50% more because fire is counterbalanced by the fact that there's tons of enemies that resist it or are immune to it. By the same token, if that spell only affects a single target, it usually does more damage to that individual single target than it would do to an AoE. And finally, if the spell is very short ranged or even melee ranged, it might even deal even more damage. For a really good comparison, look at spells like Chromatic Orb, Inflict Wounds, and Burning Hands, all of which are examples of spells that they would normally do about 2d6 points of damage as a first level spell, but Burning Hands is a fire spell that's very short range, Chromatic Orb, on, on, on the other hand, is a single target, and Inflict Wounds is a single target and melee range. Meanwhile, when talking about damage types, if your spell does Psychic, Force, Radiant, or Thunder damage, it might do a little less, and that's because these are some of the least resisted or immune uh, damage types in the entire game. So they're going to hit more reliably and they're going to damage almost everybody that they hit. So they're not going to be quite as powerful as the fire spells. They might do slightly below the average that we're talking about. The only outlier here tends to be poison. Poison is a damage type that has so many monsters that are immune to it and yet it doesn't tend to deal as much damage as fire spells do. So it's one of those ones that's hard to hold up as an example. Um, whereas, because it, it kind of falls into the same part where cold damage and lightning damage and necrotic damage live, despite the fact that there's far more monsters that are just flat out immune to it. While you're deciding the damage that your spell is going to do, you also might start working on whether your spell is an attack roll or a saving throw. And there's a few simple ideas here to help you decide. A lot of times spells that require both are either, in our opinion, not very great, unless they're one of the standout options like Ice Knife, where you hit a single target with a spell attack and then you see the alternate effect with a saving throw. If you have one of those one-two punch spells like Ice Knife, Ice Knife is a great example to base it on, where you hit a target for damage and then see if an additional effect takes place. When you have a spell that works using an attack roll, generally the attack roll is dealing direct damage only. You never see a spell in D&D 5e where you make an attack roll and on a hit, the target is stunned. If that spell existed, it would be really, really good. Usually what you'll see is the damage component is on the hit and then the target gets to make a saving throw against the additional effects or if there is an AoE sort of effect. That's how you decide whether you should be attack roll or saving throw. When in doubt, they'll usually go with the saving throw. Another great question in this category, though, is what saving throw should you use? We have six different ability scores, all of which actually advertise a different type of spell that you're trying to save against. With something like a strength saving throw, usually these are spells that move you around, something that might knock you prone or move you, push you back 10 feet. With a dexterity saving throw, you're looking at spells that usually have some sort of effect that can be dodged, maybe something like fireball, an explosion of magical energy, something that if the character moves swiftly out of the way, they don't take as much damage or take none at all. Constitution saves usually deal with the body, something like poison effects, cold or necrotic effects, spells that might force you to withstand or endure against the effect. When it comes to intelligence, these are effects that rack the mind. Usually you're looking at psychic damage or illusion magic. Spells like Synaptic Static or Tasha's Mind Whip, which directly affect the mental capacity of the character. With Wisdom, you're looking at mostly spells that induce charm or fear. Some great examples of these are Dominate Person and Fear. Intelligence and wisdom saving throws often have a lot of overlap between each other, and there's a lot of wisdom saving throw abilities that also deal psychic damage too. Although the more recent design trends of D&D 5e have seen the psychic damage move over into an intelligence-based thing, and wisdom occasionally can do necrotic damage. If you look at spells like Toll the Dead and even Spirit Guardians, but I would say that these are the weird outlier exceptions and not the general rule. 
Charisma saves are usually going to be against your state of being or your existence within the world. These are often one of the most rare saving throws that you make, but spells like Banishment that try to send you to another demiplane or another realm of existence are going to be Charisma saves. In general though, Strength, Intelligent, and Charisma saving throws are pretty rare, whereas Dexterity, Constitution, and Wisdom saving throws are relatively common amongst the spells that are already in the game. This is because in general, player characters and monsters tend to have really good dexterity, constitution, or wisdom saving throws, making spells that target strength, intelligence, and charisma actually really powerful for this element alone. So that can be used as a balancing factor in what your spell does, in addition to linking it to the flavor more broadly. As we said earlier though, the effect that you can tie to your spell and how powerful that is for the level is usually a question of magnitude and not a specific effect. Well, we generally don't see spells that let you fly come online before third level spell slots. We have Misty Step as a low level teleportation spell. And you can see with teleportation, Misty Step, Dimension Door, Teleport are actually on a very elegant progression of how far away you're getting to teleport and how many people you can bring along with you. Just as damage dealing spells tend to scale up in magnitude and spells that control the battlefield tend to scale up in the number of targets and efficiency. So overall, the, what level your spell can be and what effects you can use, it's, it again, it's that usually that question of how many targets does it affect, how reliable is it, and it wouldn't be theoretically impossible to have a first level spell that stuns somebody, but that might have to be a spell that was very short range that only affected a single target that only lasted for a single round, and even then it would probably be really strong. Even when we look at summoning spells, they arrive at pretty low levels and scale up a little bit all over the place up to the high levels of play. Really, what you change with a summoning spell is the power and potency of the creatures that you can summon and their usefulness on the battlefield. Something like a familiar has pretty limited but very valuable uses as opposed to summoning a shadow spawn or summoning a demon, which have much broader implications for their uses in battle, much more hit points with the ability to damage enemies and defend the characters. Now that you've created your spell, you've decided what level it's going to be, what type of damage it's doing, whether it's a saving throw or an attack roll, a few last components to think of is, does it have a costly material component? Or should this spell be a ritual? Let's start with the costly material component. Sometimes this is a great limiter for a spell that can be really, really powerful. But if you're adding costly components, especially ones that get consumed, keep in mind that the player characters will need to constantly be fueling these spells by buying the right things that they need. If you have a very specific costly component that is a rare item that the party needs to seek out, you might be creating a spell that is a bit of an adventure cue as well. If your spell requires a tuning fork, well, the players now need to adventure somewhere to find the right tuning fork. So be aware of when your spell is advertising an adventure using a costly component. It's very rare for a spell to have a material component cost, but then be way more powerful for its level. For example, if there was a third level spell that was super fireball, that did 20 d6 points of damage, but required the players to have a 1000 gold piece material component that was consumed by the spell, that would actually be a little bit of an oddball. And generally that kind of cost doesn't normally allow a spell to break the bounds of what it should do for its level. By the same token, be careful about spells that say do damage to the caster or cause some sort of drawback to the caster in exchange for dealing more damage than they should be able to. This is possible, but it's not necessarily easy to balance because players are creative people. And generally speaking, if you put a drawback on a spell, but that spell does a lot of extra damage, the players are going to find a way to mitigate the drawback and not have to pay that cost. More effective drawbacks tend to be things like exhaustion, but you even have to be careful with that because exhaustion can be removed using a greater restoration spell. So that's something that has to be thought about really, really carefully. When we talk about ritual spells, some things to keep in mind when you're designing a ritual spell is that it should have a casting time of one minute or longer already. 
Ritual spells are being advertised as spells that you are not going to use in combat. So a few things to keep in mind is if you're designing a non-combat spell, what are the implications for exploration or other encounters that they might have in the games of D&D? And are you okay with this spell being cast without needing a spell slot if they have the time to do so? Usually you're looking at spells that are going to fix a minor problem in the game of D&D. If there's a minor exploration problem that the party continually runs into and there's no spell to currently fix it, but you think if they make the choice to take this spell to alleviate that small problem and it's a ritual spell, that's a great time to use that. There are many spells with long casting times that aren't rituals. Scrying, for example, is not a ritual spell because the idea that the players could be continually spying over and over and over and over and over again is pretty powerful. So that's why it still requires a spell slot. On the other hand, detect magic and identify are rituals because identify is only useful as the number of magic items sitting in front of you. And while detect magic can get a little spammy sometimes, Ultimately, it's usually used as an investigative tool, and it's usually okay for the players to look around and try to sense magic. So you can use that as a barometer for when to decide. Also be careful with ritual spells that then have some sort of implication for combat. Leoman's Tiny Hut is a ritual spell that probably shouldn't be a ritual spell, because there's actually crafty ways to use it in battle if you're really, really smart about it. So if you're creating a ritual spell that allows the player characters to prepare the battlefield in some way or reshape the terrain, it's probably an indication that it shouldn't be a ritual and should require a spell slot because it needs to have that cost there. Now, the great thing about these ritual spells, even Leoman's Tiny Hut and something like Detect Magic, is that what you're advertising by putting the ritual tag on it is that, yeah, they can blow a spell slot to put up their tent, their tiny hut, or they can blow a spell slot to do Detect Magic when they're in a dangerous environment. But if they find themselves in a situation where they come across something magical, but there's no danger nearby, now they get to use it in an investigative way to help Get gain information because your spellcaster knows a bit about magic and can sit there for 10 minutes and focus their energy on discovering the properties of this magical artifact. These, these are really cool ways of saying that a spell that could be used in combat also has investigative and interesting applications outside of combat. Finally, when we're talking about spells that can be used over and over again, it is worth mentioning cantrips, which have their own set of considerations, because cantrips are spells that can be used at will, but that have a natural scaling often built into them when it comes to dealing damage. It's very With, with cantrips, generally they only deal one die of damage, but they gain that additional damage die as the characters level up if they're a damage-dealing cantrip. And the, if it's not a damage-dealing cantrip, you really just have to ask yourself, what happens if the players can cast this over and over and over and over and over again? And generally speaking, a cantrip can do the types of things that an attack or a person can do in a slightly augmented way. That's why there isn't a cantrip that gives out temporary hit points or heals people, because you could just keep touching your friend, and even though the cantrip only heals one hit point, well... You know, 60 minutes later, they're back up to full hit points. With all of that in mind, the most important thing that you can do with your homebrew spell is try it out. Lots of playtesting will be necessary to finesse and make sure that it's working properly at the table. Once you have all of this in mind, again, we've given you some structural foundations. Feel free to break those structures where needed, reshape them, rework them, and create the fantasy of the spell you want to make. But try it out with your friends in a one-shot or a simple um, adventure where let your players know that you're trying out a brand new homebrew spell and it might go through a few iterations before its final form. Try it with a villain against the party. If one of the party members dies because you made way too powerful of a spell, feel free to retcon that. Let your players <laughs> know in advance that you're trying these things out. That's why usually a one-shot or a short adventure are a great time to do these. Maybe hand them out to your players. Maybe you've made three or four spells. Hand them out to the players, throw some enemies in there, see what these spells feel like against the monsters. 
By trying them out, you're going to see what works and what doesn't work, and you're going to start to learn the balance and understanding of what it takes to make a memorable and creative spell in Dungeons & Dragons. So this has been a look at how to homebrew spells in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. Tell us about some of the amazing spells you've created in the comments below. The videos that we make on our channel are made possible thanks to the incredible generosity and amazing feedback of our Patreon supporters. We discussed the ideas for this episode in our monthly Writer's Room discussion and got some great ideas from our patrons, so thank you to all of you on our Discord... Our, um, so thank you to all of you on our Discord Patreon community for, who joined us for the Writer's Room for this episode for your amazing ideas and creativity and feedback on this one. If you enjoy the work that we do here on YouTube and want to support our channel and take part in these discussions, you can find out all about that by following the links in the description below. And make sure to check out our live play Shadows of Drakenheim, which is airing on Tuesday nights at 6 p.m. Eastern on Twitch. You can find all the previous episodes of that show right up over here. And we've got plenty more advice for Dungeon Masters and D&D 5e right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next time in, in the, the Dungeon. dungeon.